All right, Life of Jesus, Chronological Order, lesson number, lesson number 10. Uh, in this, our 10th lesson, The Life of Jesus, we're going to review events that took place in the final phase between the third Passover and His final week. So there's some events that take place during that period of time. Uh, we've seen Jesus' pattern of movement. There's a, remember I said there's a pattern, there's a, there's a method to all of this. He comes into Jerusalem for the major feasts to teach. The crowds are there. He proclaims his identity with miracles, pronouncements on his deity. And then he, he retreats back to the safety of the northern region when things just become, obviously he's, he's provoking the leaders with what he's teaching, what he's saying. And so they respond to him negatively. And so he moves back to the northern region, continues his, uh, his ministry in that area. So today in our lesson we're going to look at events that took place as Jesus was passing through the northern region one last time before entering Jerusalem and of course suffering His arrest and His, uh, his crucifixion. Now previously the Jewish leadership had officially sanctioned His death. It's been decided. Caiaphas, the high priest, leading the charge, and so uh, Jesus returns to the northern country for one last tour of ministry with His apostles. And so that leads us into event number 107. That's where we should be tonight, number 107. Jesus heals 10 lepers. Luke 17, 11 to 19. Now Luke specifies that Jesus was on the frontier of Samaria and on His way to Jerusalem. Ten lepers cry out to him for mercy. They didn't come near, obviously, because they weren't permitted by law to approach, to be near uh, someone. Jesus tells them to show themselves to the priests, the healed lepers uh, in that society, in that time, according to the law. If there was a healing, if they got better, um, had to show themselves to the priest. They had a certain priests, they had a certain procedure to to prove that the, the leprosy was cleansed. You have to understand too that at that time, what went under the banner of leprosy were all kinds of skin diseases. Not just the leprosy that we know today, that the type of disease you know, that's not, they have no cure for it, you know, where your fingers fall off and your nose and all that kind of thing. Uh, psoriasis, for example, you know, people who have psoriasis, flaky skin, that, that was also under that banner of leprosy. So there were all kinds of skin diseases that went under that Banner. That's why skin diseases that normally were healed in some way, uh, they had to have proof. And so they went to the priests to prove uh, that, they, uh, that they were well. But, uh, Dave, did you have something to offer? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, you know, people don't realize that some armadillos carry leprosy. Armadillos carry leprosy. All right. <laughs> Even today. No, I'm serious. I know, I, I know you are. <laughs> I, I, I can't quite fit that into Luke, but you know? <laughs> we still, yeah, I know what you're saying. We still have leprosy today. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah absolutely. We, it's still a disease that there's, uh, there's no cure for. Really? The armadillo. All right. So they all believe in Him as they turn and they run towards the officials to receive their confirmation of healing. Um, there's only one, and it's mentioned that he's a Samaritan, that turns and comes to Jesus to give thanks, receives, uh, and actually uh, receives a more um, important blessing, and that is the forgiveness for, he didn't, say the, uh, he didn't say to the others, your sins are forgiven, he just said you're healed. But the one who comes back to, to thank him, to, to worship him, him, he says, your sins are forgiven. So the other nine were like those actually who, you know, who ate the bread when He multiplied the bread and the fish. You know, wow, they saw a miracle. They ate it. You know, they filled their tummies. You know, what a great thing. And then they walked away. Man, we saw a great thing today. But it didn't affect them uh, any more than in that. They weren't touched. Their bellies were full, but their souls uh, weren't changed. So the leper who returns to give thanks and pay homage to the Lord showed that the healing produced faith in Him and that faith as Jesus said, saved his soul. Number 108, prophecy concerning the end. Prophecy concerning the end, Luke 17, 20 to 37. Now the Pharisees believed that the coming of the kingdom of God would be a good thing for them personally. They didn't mind talk of the kingdom coming, It'd be a good thing for them. 
They thought that the kingdom would usher in a golden era of Jewish supremacy, much like the time of David, the time of Solomon. They thought, we're going to go back to the old days. You know, we'll be free, we'll be you know, a special uh, nation. And of course, they were the leaders. And so if they're going to come into a golden time, who are the ones that are going to get the gold? Well, the ones who are at the top. So the leaders were very happy for the coming of the kingdom uh, as they thought it would be. So they ask Jesus about the coming of the kingdom and Jesus answers them using language that was very hard to discern. He uses what's called apocalyptic language, type of language you use in the book of Revelation, for example, the book of Daniel. Usually the prophets use this kind of language when they were talking about great events that would take place, the fall of a kingdom or the, you know, something momentous that would happen. And so they use this type of language, you know, uh, the moon would, the stars would fall, the moon would be filled with blood, you know, apocalyptic language. So Jesus uses apocalyptic language and He gives them a message they're not quite ready for. He says, first of all, that the kingdom, well, don't wait for it, it's already here. It's among them, and because they are missing it, they're going to suffer a crisis, the judgment of the Son of Man. The coming of the Son of Man meant judgment. You're going to be judged. It was a way of saying a judgment was coming. Secondly, he says the crisis would come upon them suddenly and without warning. Don't try to get ready for it. You've missed it already. And thirdly, the crisis would bring devastation to them. That's why he uses old style apocalyptic language, because he's talking about the devastation that's going to come. Of course, he's referring to the fact that he is ushering in the kingdom of God. He's doing it. He's bringing in the kingdom of God. So that when he says, it's among you, he's talking about himself. I'm, I'm here. And he embodies it, but they refuse to accept him, so they will be judged for this when he will visit judgment upon them. The coming of the Son of Man isn't necessarily a time thing, it's an event. And we know what the event is. His warning is that because of this, they will be destroyed suddenly and only a few will escape. Well, we know what happens, right? We know this prophecy that he makes, how it's fulfilled. In 70 AD, the Roman army comes, surrounds the city, lays siege to it for a lengthy time, and eventually destroys the city, destroys the temple, burns everything down. Nothing left except one thing that still stands today, and what's that? The Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, still, that's the last piece that uh, is still standing. As a matter of fact, what's interesting, when you visit there, a lot of the stones that are you know, at the bottom that are still there, some of the rubble is the original rubble from back uh, 2,000 years ago uh, at the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, 70 AD, very uh, fascinating thing. And the people who escaped were not Jews. Who escaped in 70 AD? Christians are the ones who escaped Jerusalem. Uh, that were in the city at that time. And so we move on to uh, 109. Uh, he goes on, follows this now with a teaching on parables, uh, parables about perseverance and pride, Luke 18, 1 to 14. Now in the last ministry tour, Jesus gives parables that deal with a personal relationship with God. And so the parable of the widow who pesters a city official to give her justice until he gives in shows that perseverance is a powerful force even in the hands of the weak. Even in the hands of the weak, perseverance is nevertheless a powerful tool. This he taught to encourage the people to persevere in prayer to Almighty God even though they were weak and sinful. Their persevering prayers were powerful tools in appealing to God who, unlike the uncaring official in the parable, God wasn't like him. God is really interested in his people's concerns. Someone today called me up, a member of the church, I won't say who, but a member of the church called me up and said, would you at a certain time pray for me? Because something's happening at that time and I need, the, I need prayer. Because exactly like this, I'm going and I'm meeting the officials of the land who have all the power and I have no power. And I, I'm, I'm appealing to them for a certain thing that only these officials can grant me. <clears throat> sure, I said. And so at the, I must confess, the clock went past a little, but at, at that time, this, in the afternoon, I saw the memo on my desk. And so you know, I just stopped everything and, and I prayed for her. 
Same thing here. She persevered in prayer and she enlisted me to pray with her. And she's here tonight and I asked her, so she said, God granted my prayer. The officials who had the power relented and gave me what I asked for. So the power of prayer and perseverance in prayer is a powerful thing, even in the hands of the smallest and the weakest. And then the second parable is the parable of the publican and the Pharisee. This one shows two men praying, the Pharisee judging himself in comparison to the sinful publican, and he finds himself pretty good. Wow, I'm pretty good next to this guy. And then the publican judging himself by God's law and finding himself guilty and unworthy. So the, so the Pharisee judges himself against another man. And the publican or the tax collector or the sinner, he doesn't judge himself against another man because surely he could have found someone worse than him. <laughs> no, he judges himself against God's law, against God's commands, and he finds himself you know, coming, up, coming up short. And Jesus shows that God's mercy is on those who humbly acknowledge their sins and His judgment is on those who try to just, or, and His judgment is on those who actually try to justify themselves. It's always the thing that I tell people when they come to see me for counseling because there's a sin, there's an issue, there's something, you know, they've messed up and so on and so forth. And sometimes I hear in their voice the attempt to justify, the attempt, the attempt to use the law, God's law, God's commandments, you know, to kind of find a loophole. And I say, no, 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 no. Here's what you need to do now. You need to throw yourself on the mercy of God. That's what you need to do. Don't, don't go up to God and quote Him the law. <laughs> you know? Don't go up to God and say, you know, I have a loophole around this thing that you commanded. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. Your best bet is always to, not best bet, but your best recourse. <laughs> I have a gambling problem. <clears throat> the, uh, the best recourse, obviously, is always to seek out uh, God's mercy. So these parables were actually thinly veiled uh, rebukes of the, officials ruling, the official ruling class of religious leaders who had failed both in giving justice and mercy to others and who had been too proud. You know, the Pharisees, they never went to Jesus. They figured, oh, we got nothing. You, know, you, don't, you don't have anything for us. You're offering forgiveness and mercy. We don't need that. We're sons of Abraham. We're the leaders here. We're, here, we're telling you what to do. You're not telling us what to do. And consequently, they, they missed it. They missed the kingdom. Number 110, again with the Pharisees. Oh dear. So the Pharisees now question Jesus about divorce. It's interesting that after he has you know, this thinly veiled parable that kind of aims at them and shows their deficiencies, their lack of leadership, the fact that they're missing the kingdom, the fact that they will be first in line to be judged, you know, that, that this foray that Jesus does with these parables is answered now by the, by the Pharisees who now ask Him questions on marriage and divorce, a very hot topic at the time in uh, Matthew 19, 1 to 15, Mark 10, 1 to 16, and then Luke 18, 15 to 17. <clears throat> so as, Je as Jesus uh, leaves the far northern part of the country around Galilee and heads south, He's confronted in the region of Perea by Pharisees who wish, who wish to trap him, and that was the point here, they wanted to trap him using the issue of divorce. Now we need to understand that at the time there were two main schools of thought on the teaching of the law concerning divorce found in Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 1. The whole debate was about Deuteronomy 24 verse 1, so let's take a look at Deuteronomy. It says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house. This particular passage had two uh, interpretations at the time that were uh, uh, promoted by different schools of prophet, not prophets, excuse me, rabbi, rabbin, uh, rabbinical teachers. The two of them were Shammai and Hillel. <clears throat> Rabbi Shammai said that the word indecency or the idea of indecency here was some kind of shameful sexual behavior, fornication of some kind. Okay? Rabbi Hillel um, and that school of thought 
uh, said that the indecency that was mentioned in Deuteronomy was any behavior that the husband did not like. I mean, from burning the supper to I don't like the way you're raising our children or you know, any, in anything that he did not like was grounds for him to put away his wife. And so there was a debate that was going on at the time between the two, these two schools of thought. So the Pharisees come to him, like they come to him on, on all the, you know, which is the greatest command? You know, uh, 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 should we pay taxes to Caesar? You know, always the trick question. So they come to him with the trick question and they say, can a man divorce for any reason? provoking him to side with, well, you know, what side are you on? Now, we have to understand that at the time, only the men were allowed to divorce. In other words, they're the only ones who could initiate a divorce. A woman could not initiate a divorce against her husband. Only the man could initiate the divorce against the wife. That was the, the, how it went at the time. So they're trying to trap him. So we have to look at the trap. If he agrees with Shammai, well then they're going to accuse him of being a hypocrite because he had associated with sinners and he had forgiven the woman caught in adultery. You know, if he says, oh Shammai, you know, indecency means some sort of sexual behavior, misbehavior, so on and so forth. If he says, well I agree, that's the way it ought to be. They're going to say, what kind of hypocrite are you? You're, you know, you're condemning you know, fornication and yet you're with fornicators, you're, you eat with them, you're a hypocrite. And on the other hand, if he agreed with Hillel, well then they'd accuse him of being soft on divorce or being a liberal. I don't think they had that word at that time, but you know, the same thing. And then again, if he says, you know what, I don't agree with either one, then they'd accuse him of violating the law since he, you know, the law permitted divorce. So Jesus responds to them by teaching them several basic lessons about marriage, and He teaches about marriage here. Uh, things that they had either overlooked or they misunderstood. First of all, He says, marriage is a creation of God, not man. That's the first thing He teaches them. It's a, God is the one that invented marriage or that created marriage, not invent, men invents, God creates. It was instituted in Genesis at the beginning and the rules that govern it are still there. One man, one woman for life, Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. Again, we don't have time to you know, deconstruct all the passages, but I thought they're important enough that we kind of comment on them a little bit. So the first thing is marriage is the creation of God. Second thing he says is that uh, the instructions in the law permitting divorce did not change the original design of marriage. Because you know, when he talks to them, he brings them back to Genesis. He doesn't go to Deuteronomy. But he does explain, he says, because of the hardness of your hearts. In other words, the instructions about divorce in Deuteronomy were put there because with the, when was marriage invented? When was marriage created? Before sin or after sin? before sin. So when God created marriage, well, there was no sin. So there was no provision for sin. Right? Adam and Eve hadn't sinned. But after sin enters the world, there needed to be direction as to what to do when sin destroyed a marriage. Now Jesus says, you know, in the hardness of your hearts, the interesting thing about that word hardness there in the original Greek, uh, another word for that would be callous. You know, when somebody says they're callous, no feeling, no empathy, no sympathy. He says, because of the callousness of your attitude, of your heart, Moses directed this. Now in the hardness of their hearts, what was happening in the time of Moses is that men were putting away their wives without any legal standing for the woman. Remember, she wasn't allowed to sue for divorce. The man could put her out. But what was happening is they were putting the women out and the women who were put out of their homes for whatever reason had no legal standing in the community. And so because of this, she could not remarry, which was her only option to support herself in that culture. 
And so what would happen is that many of these women would turn to prostitution. Or they would marry, but marry in shame. Or cohabitate without marriage. And so they had no legal status. So what does Moses do? He requires a bill of divorce so that the woman was legally free and had status within the community. Also legally free to remarry. As it says, if you read again, Deuteronomy 24, he says, when a man takes a wife, marries her, happens that he sh she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. Because now she has a legal status, she doesn't have to, but she has a legal status in the community. Okay, third thing he says, Sexual immorality breaks the bond of marriage. What breaks the bond of marriage is a violation against the very thing that sustains the bond, and that's sexual intimacy. When there is fornication, fornication is sexual sin that includes cheating, unfaithfulness, homosexuality, whatever forms of sexual impurity. When there is that, a marriage bond is broken and a legal divorce is permissible in these cases without bringing guilt upon the innocent party. That's what Moses was talking about, and Jesus is saying, except for the case of fornication. So now, if you followed my you know, train of thought here, who did Jesus agree with? Shammai or Hillel? Huh? Shammai, oh no, he agreed with Shammai. Shammai said, the indecency was sexual indecency. It was sexual misbehavior. That was the cause. And if there was that, he had to give her a bill. If, you know, if there isn't that, he couldn't divorce her. He shouldn't divorce her. It would be a sin. But if he were to divorce her, he had to give a bill of divorcement. He had to give that woman some sort of status in the community. He couldn't just abandon her. So what breaks the bond of marriage is sexual sin. Now the thing we have to understand is that Jesus didn't say you couldn't break the bond of marriage. He said you shouldn't break the bond of marriage. Just like the commandment says, thou shalt not kill, right? Can, can we kill? Well, yeah, it happens all the time, but it's a sin. Uh, thou shalt not steal. What, do people steal? Well, yeah. God said, you know, uh, whatever God joins together, let not man put asunder. Whatever God joins together, don't break apart. Does that mean man can't break apart? Well, yeah, he can. He just shouldn't, because when he does, it's a sin. All right, fourth thing, we won't, you know. The guilty party was guilty of several sins. Remember, I'm just sticking to what Jesus is saying here. So he says one more thing, and he says the guilty party is guilty of several sins. The ones who divorced their partners for reasons other than sex sins were guilty of several sins themselves. First of all, they unlawfully divorced. You know, what did God say? Don't do that. And I put it together, you know, don't break it apart. Well, if you break it apart, you just, you know, you've, you've unlawfully done something. Secondly, they committed adultery by breaking their marriage vows. Now we open a little parenthetical statement here. The word adultery doesn't only refer to a sexual sin. As a matter of fact, the original word meant vow breaker. And it's only in modern times that the term adultery has come to mean strictly a sexual sin, but it wasn't like that in, in the Bible. The word adultery is, comes from a Latin term that was transliterated into the English. It's not even a Greek word. You know, like, I'll give you an example, like baptism. Baptism is not an English word, is it? It's, it's, it's a, an, a transliteration from the Greek word baptizo. They didn't, if you translated it, it would be immersed or plunged, right? But they didn't do that, they just transliterated it. They took the Greek word baptizo and they made it an English word, baptized. Same thing happened from the Latin, with the Latin, the root of that word, into English. But anyways, I'm digressing way too much here. So the word adultery doesn't refer only to a sex sin, it also means the breaking of a vow or idolatry. 
Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 19, Ezekiel 23, 37, Matthew chapter 12, 39, James 4, 4, you know, many references in the Bible where the term is talking about the breaking of a vow, a, to being unfaithful to a promise. And note that he doesn't say, you know, he doesn't say except for fornication and marries another person, that person commits fornication. He says those who, you know, he, Jesus doesn't say if the one who puts away his wife except for fornication and then marries another commits fornication. He says the one who puts away his wife except for fornication, sexual sin, and marries another commits adultery, different word. Adultery means the breaking of, it can mean a sexual sin, but it can also mean the breaking of a vow, unfaithfulness to a promise. So what do these people do? They committed adultery, they broke vows, that's the other sin, unlawful divorce, marriage vow. Thirdly, they caused their innocent partners to be stigmatized as adulterers in the eyes of society because all who would assume you know, everybody who saw the woman that was put away except for fornication would assume, well, she must be an adulteress because that's the only reason that she should be put away. So the man who put out his wife caused her to be stigmatized as an adulteress in society. And then he says, and anyone who would, that she would marry would also be stigmatized in that society as being an adulterer. And so you have to understand he's, he's talking to Pharisees, and the Pharisees were notorious for their many divorces, and Jesus does not permit them to justify themselves by claiming that they had a legal divorce. That was the argument. Can we marry, can we divorce for any reason? And then the, these guys believe, well sure, as long as, you get, as long as you do the paperwork. As long as you do the paperwork, it's good. And Jesus said, no, 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 not so fast. This is what you do when you divorce, for the, for, you know, not for the cause of fornication. You break God's law, you commit adultery, breaking of the vow, you stigmatize, in other words, you stigmatize your partner and anyone else in the future. So he piles it on to the, to the uh, Pharisees. And he shows them that the law that governs marriage is in Genesis and he demonstrates the extent of the damage they did when they divorced. Of course, there's further teaching on this in 1 Corinthians, but we're not going to go there. Now, it's after this confrontation that Jesus stops to bless little children brought to him, and he warns the apostles and everyone else not to hinder children to come to him. You know, the idea here is that innocence and trusting faith was important to, uh, to succeed in marriage, as it was to enter into the kingdom. You, know, you had to be very much like a child to succeed in marriage, to have that trusting faithfulness to one another, that confidence in one another, and that same spirit was necessary not only to succeed in marriage, but it was necessary to succeed in entering into the kingdom. Okay, uh, 111, the rich young ruler, Matthew 19, 16 to 30. Matthew 10, 17 to 31, Luke 18. How are we doing on time? All right. So the, the rich young ruler represents what was best about the Jewish nation. He was young, he was wealthy, he was knowledgeable of the law, and he was pious in the fact that he tried to keep the law. And the result of this behavior, however, simply brought him to the point that he realized something, he did all of this and there was still something missing, imagine. Still something missing. He wants eternal life and he confesses that with all his trying, he still hasn't grasped it. So Jesus tells him to get, in order to get eternal life, he has to leave his temporal life. And for this guy, it meant his money and his position and follow him. And at his meeting with the Lord, the young man found out what really was standing in his way of eternal life. It was his love of wealth. Jesus takes the opportunity here to warn about the danger of wealth and how its pursuit can blind and block a person's ability to see or enter into the spiritual kingdom. You know, he made, well, it wasn't a mistake, but it was a mistake for him. He asked Jesus, tell me what it is, tell me the secret, tell me what I got to do. And Jesus told him, okay. <laughs> 
He would have preferred, you know, contribute your, some of your wealth or walk on coals, you know, do something like that or give up meat. But Jesus, you know, he went right to the heart of the matter. And isn't that how he does with us too? He goes right to the heart of the matter with us, right? So Jesus takes the opportunity here to warn about the danger of wealth. Peter at this point complains that the apostles have already given up their wealth to follow Jesus and the Lord reassures Peter that their reward will far outweigh what they've given up for him. The first, that is the rich and powerful, will be last. The last, the humble and weak, will be first in the kingdom. Number 112, parable of the laborers. We got to move fast. So in uh, Matthew 21 to 16, so in line with this warning about riches and services, Jesus also teaches about attitude by telling the parable of the workers uh, who were hired at different times of the day for the same pay. Remember, it, it all follows. The Pharisees attack him. He comes, you know, they, they attack him with you know, a, a trick question on marriage and divorce. He comes back to them. The young ruler comes to him. What do I need to do for eternal life? He comes back about the, the, the danger of wealth. And then he continues the teaching, he piggybacks the teaching with the laborers in the vineyard. And in this parable he shows that whatever we receive from the Lord, it's always fair. It's always generous. It's not based on our deserving work, it's always based on His kindness. An interesting thing about this particular passage, this is one of the three occasions where Jesus uses the saying, the first shall be last, the last shall be first, he uses it in three different places, three different occasions. <coughs> Excuse me, the other time, you know, response to Peter, the apostle, we just talked about, and then response to questions about who will be saved in Luke chapter 13, verse 30. But he uses this three times, three different times. 113, Jesus predicts his death resurrection a third time. Matthew 20, Mark 10, Luke 18, you've got all those details on the slide. So he predicts his death and resurrection, but this time he gives more details in the manner of his suffering. He even tells he'll be spit upon, he'll be scourged, and that he'll be killed by the Gentiles, not the Jews. In other words, he talks about the cross. As well, a clear, as, well as a clear indication of his resurrection three days later. So he's becoming more graphic and more clear with his description. Luke says that even at this late date, the apostles still did not understand what he was talking about. Imagine, we're getting close to the end. It's two and a half, two and three quarter you know, years and they still, they're not quite understanding it. And, and you know, I don't blame them. I mean, we've had 2,000 years of teaching and repetition of this thing, of this great event, the resurrection. For them, it was all new. 114, James and John's request. How, <laughs> how timely. Matthew 20, Mark 10. So here are these two guys, sensing that the time of an important event is near. He's hearing them say, the kingdom is near, the kingdom is coming, the kingdom is here, great things are going to happen. Of course, they're thinking the coming of an earthly kingdom with the apostles at the lead. You know, the Pharisees were thinking, yeah, bring it. A kingdom coming? Bring it. We're, we're, the, we're, we're the top guys now. You know, we're, it'll be us. And then the apostles, Jesus talking about the kingdom. Yeah, bring it. That's for us. We're the top guys. We're His disciples. We're His closest disciples. So G, uh, James and John make a bid for choice positions in the new order of things. You know, to sit at the right and left of the throne. And we know this upsets the others. They resent their grab for power. And Jesus answers this situation by telling them that you know, they have not and they will not suffer in the way that, you know, that He will suffer in order to earn this right. And He tells them that they will, however, suffer because of the kingdom and they will gain their request. They will sit on the left or the right. Well, they'll sit on the right because the church is at the right hand of God. And then the high position that they seek is obtained through service and humility in the kingdom, not by jockeying for power. Isn't that the way we select leaders in the church? 
deacons, elders, right? What does the Bible say? Watch how they serve. You know, and I've, I've been to enough elders meetings to, to see that somebody who comes in and says, and I've been at enough elders meeting where they're interviewing prospective elders when a, a, a brother comes in and says, I've always wanted to be an elder. <laughs> Stars in his eyes, you know. <laughs> you know, and I could just feel the pens going, <coughs> sorry, Whoop, deep six, that application. <laughs> so brethren, if you go in thinking about being an elder, you know, get the stars out of your eyes, okay? Number 115, Jesus heals two blind men. Matthew 20, Mark 10, Luke 18. So in the reading of the three accounts, we see that one of the two blind men was named Bartimaeus, and he was the one who called out to Jesus by proclaiming, pro proclaiming him as the Messiah, the son of David. Uh, both were discouraged in bothering Jesus, in other words, they were, they were told not to bother him, but the Lord assured um, their call and he, healed, he answered their call and he healed their blindness. Interesting that the name of one of the blind men, Bartimaeus, suggests that he, he became a well-known member of the Jerusalem church. There's writing about him in extra biblical uh, literature. Number 116, Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house. The kids love this story about Zacchaeus, that he was, he was short. So the miracle of healing the blind men occurred as Jesus is entering Jericho, which is northeast of Jerusalem. After this miracle, the crowds follow him as he goes through the city, and one person in the crowd was the chief tax collector for that place, and that's Zacchaeus. Uh, we know that he was short, so he had to climb a tree to see him go by, and Jesus spots him and said that he would eat with him. Now, we have to understand that Zacchaeus was probably the most despised man in the city. And he was the least worthy to receive Jesus. But when the opportunity came, he gladly received Jesus into his home. I love this idea, you know, um, sinners are welcome. You know, I always said that, should be our motto. Sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. You know, Jesus welcomed sinners. And the reason that is, because everybody in the church are sinners. That's all we are, sinners. The one thing that, the two things that, the two things that, uh, that we have in common, we're all sinners and we've all been redeemed by Christ. After that, we're all different but we are the same in those two areas. So while eating, of course, we know the story, Zacchaeus so overwhelmed with gratitude that he publicly repents of his sins, commits himself to doing right, and Jesus forgives and blesses him uh, there. All right, the parable of the minas, the pounds, Luke 19. So during the same dinner, the question of when the kingdom would arrive comes up again, and Jesus continually asked this question because they were anxious for their version of the kingdom to arrive. Since they felt ready for it and it would benefit them. Always the false idea, the false notion of what the kingdom was. So Jesus says, and He answers with the parable of the minas or the pounds, a measure of money, it's about $25, $30 worth today. So the parable is similar to the one in Matthew about the talents, but it's a different parable and it's told to a different group. In the story of the rebellious subjects who refuse uh, to submit to a nobleman while he's away and when he returns he punishes them. While he's away he leaves his ten slaves with money to invest and like the parable of the talents the ones who succeed are rewarded and the ones who are lazy or afraid they lose the little that they have. So the parables are they're parallel but there really are two different parables. The point for the Jews was that they had both been rebellious and unprofitable and were about to be punished by losing what they had. That's the point of the parable. It's always about the Jews. It's always about the kingdom coming. It's always about being ready for it. You know, he keeps saying it over and over and over again in 20 different ways, but it's always the same thing. And then finally, Mary anoints Jesus with perfume. Matthew 26, Mark 14, John 11 and 12. So Jesus leaves Jericho, he moves closer to Jerusalem by going to Bethany for a dinner in his honor at the home of Simon the leper. And this is probably the one healed by Jesus. Simon was connected to Lazarus and he was connected to Mary and Martha somehow. We, we don't quite know how, he's mentioned in that group, perhaps he was the father. Since they were at his house, 
and the women were serving food at his house. So somehow it's a, they're connected somehow. Now there were crowds around the house looking to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Could you imagine the interest? Everybody knew Lazarus was dead and here he was sitting there eating with Jesus. Everybody wanted to see what's going on. It was a final meal with friends and supporters and while eating, Mary uses expensive perfume to anoint Jesus' head as a way of honoring Him. Now when the others complain, Judas, for example, about the cost and waste, Jesus tells them that this is a preparation for His death and that Mary will always be remembered for this act. And here we are in 2011 and one more time in one other Bible lesson, the teacher in the class remember that Mary did this thing. So that prophecy is you know, being fulfilled in our classroom. We're still talking about Mary and what she did. Meanwhile, of course, dark clouds are forming around the Lord as the chief priests are plotting to seize Him. And by the way, the plot originally was Him and Lazarus. They were going to kill Him both. They were going to kill Him both because it was just too powerful a witness. The one who raised the, the, you know, the man from the dead and the man who was dead who was going around saying he didn't have to say a word. Notice there's no words from Lazarus. There's never, you know, Mary speaks, Martha speaks, Lazarus doesn't say anything. But what a powerful witness he was just being there. So they were going to kill both of them uh, according to John 12 uh, verses 9 to 10. So in our next lesson we're going to begin to review the events during Jesus' last week before His death. OK, a couple of kind of object lessons here if we wish. Number one, God deals with man based on need, not merit. It's OK when we pray to say, dear God, I need this. I need it. Note that the Jews were continually rebuked by Jesus because they came to God with their culture and their achievements and their self-righteousness. However, the ones received and blessed by the Lord were those who were aware of their own weaknesses and the ones who came to God with a need. I need you to make me righteous. I need you to forgive me. I need you to have mercy on me. Blessed are the ones who hunger and thirst for, for they will, be, they will be filled or they will be satisfied. This is a rule here. This is, this is a rule. God responds to us based on our needs, not our merit. You know, uh, when I was a kid uh, in class, they used to, the, I, I went to Catholic school, but I remember the nuns you know, that taught us in grade school and they would make us you know, put our pencils away in our desks you know, and pen in our books and we'd have to put our heads down and they would make us examine our conscience so that we would know what we, we would have to ask God for what we needed. And you know, I don't agree with all the Catholic doctrine and dogma, but you know what? That was good training. That was good training to help us understand our relationship with God. He's God and I'm, well, I'm me. And then the second thing, last thing for tonight, don't waste any opportunity to be with Jesus. The blind man, Zacchaeus, uh, uh, Simon the leper, they all took advantage of the time to be with the Lord, even if there were crowds. We should count it a privilege, not a problem for those times. Please, with the bell already, we get it. We, we can tell the time. <laughs> Anyways, the point is, don't let the world crowd out your opportunities to be with the Lord, like tonight and Sundays and prayer time and fellowship time. All right, that's it. Thank you very much.